Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. We lived out in the country on a farm. Some of it was hunting ground, and some of it was left not hunting, like you weren't allowed to hunt on it. I would always walk through the non-hunting area. I would ride my four-wheeler partway, and then walk across this area to go to a pond where I fed my fish. I drove my four-wheeler, parked it along the little dirt path that was all in woods. I then walked out of the woods and into the field that was like a cornfield that had been cut down. Then something screamed at me. It was like it was trying to scare me. I got so scared that I ducked down for half an hour, and I thought, who is messing with me? I always wore camo. It wasn't hunting season at that point, so I wasn't afraid to go on hunting ground, and the trees started shaking like in a straight path. The tops of the tree were barely shaking, but the middle of the trees were moving like something was slapping them or pushing against them. It just didn't make any sense that an animal would walk through and slap things. I was nine years old, and I was freaking out. I stood back up and walked to the fish pond. This all happened right before it got dark out. Because I went twice a day, right before it got light out in the morning, and just before dark at night. And I carried a coffee can with me full of fish food, and I would shake it every time. It was like a rattle, and it was like somebody knew I did that, but we didn't have neighbors, and nobody went out there unless they told us. I just remember getting yelled at. It was a very high-pitched, like a bunch of girls or a bunch of guys playing with me. It was like screaming from in the woods at me, and the tops of the trees were barely shaking, but I was far enough out into the field to see the path. I could see the trees moving, as it passed through the woods. It was like, I scared her. Now I'm going to move on. I knew something was going through the trees. I assumed it was walking because the sound was coming from lower, like it was screaming out and I couldn't explain it. It was so fast moving through the trees. All I know is that there were several trees in our wood and they were all moving one right after the other. The leaves were moving on the very top of each tree, and there was no wind, and you could see it was a path. If it were a large animal, it had to have its arms wrapped around the trees and shaking it. That is what I imagined. Something else unusual that happened was when I was at the pond, and I was looking at some foxholes around the embankment above the pond. I was climbing up the bank and was covered in mud. A big rock, larger than a bowling ball, just tumbled on the ground right next to me. And now that I think about it, we've had other rocks thrown at us while at that embankment. Both of my sisters were with me. We were always getting rocks thrown at us at that embankment. Not every time I was out there did I feel like I was being watched. But sometimes I thought something was following me or watching me. My two sisters were with me during the rock throwing. It was clear, warm weather. On to the next one. In Pulaski County in Illinois, I was driving back to my home at night from a friend's house in a town close by. At the time, I resided in a small village in Illinois named Karnak population only about 650. I was driving back from another small village named Grand Chain. I decided to take the back road that night like I almost did every night. It was around 11 p.m. It was fall because I had my windows down, all four of them in my four-door. The road I was driving on was a red gravel road, 
So I was taking my time and watching for deer who infest the area. I've hit deer before, so I was being very, very watchful of animals along the road, and I estimate my speed was around 20 to 25 miles per hour. I went up a small hill that had a long but even plain. As I started going down the hill, I noticed eyes off to the side of the road. I know most reports I have seen do not describe Bigfoot with glowing animal eyes, but this did, and they were very bright. I started slowing down, but didn't slam the brakes because it was still many feet away, and I knew I had more than enough time to slow down in my car. As I crept closer, I could tell the thing I was seeing off to the side was much taller than a deer. I felt a weird sense of panic come over me, so I started rolling up all the windows in my car and locked my doors. As I started to get even closer, the creature started to make its way across the road. I have never seen anything close to it or have felt as much terror as I had at that moment. It made its way and stepped onto the road about 20 feet away from my car, by this time at stop. This was not a slow or quick glimpse. It walked across the road and turned and looked at me. I would have to estimate it was seven feet or more tall. Very heavy build. It had hair covering the body, but not matted or curly. The hair was long, almost like it was combed and taken care of. The eyes, like I said before, glowed in my headlight. As it turned and looked at me, it stopped walking and stared for a good two or three seconds. I didn't know what to do. I knew if I floored the gas and hit the creature, it would wreck the car. It was massive. I had the strong feeling and presence of the creature. It may have been because it was all so shocking and frightening. I won't rule that out, but at the same time, it was a weird sense that was making me feel. It started walking on two legs and crossed the road. I never smelled anything at all. My windows were rolled down to start with, and nothing strange was going on at all. I think what I saw was a Bigfoot, even though the eyes, hair, and smell don't match other people's encounters. I've never seen anything like this before or after, it was around 11 p.m. on a clear night. I don't remember exactly the weather, but my windows were down in my car, and it was a clear night. The area does have swamp, but located a few miles away. The specific area was very rural, outside of Shawnee National Forest. There were many fields and wooded areas. On to the next one. Nearly 30 residents of Thorntown in Boone County in Indiana saw a gorilla with protruding teeth that, on one occasion, chased two fishermen. In Boone County in Indiana, fishermen Charles Joan and George Kaufman were chased from the banks of the Sugar Creek by a brown gorilla. On to the next one. In Vanderburg County in Indiana, Miss Darwin Johnson and Mrs. Chris Lample were swimming in the Ohio River near Evansville when suddenly something grabbed Miss Johnson's left leg from behind. They were 15 feet from shore, and there were large claws and a furry palm gripping her knee, and as something yanked her under, Mrs. Johnson kicked and fought and went under again. Mrs. Lamble, in an inner tube four feet away, kicked and screamed, trying to scare whatever it was away. Mrs. Johnson lunged for the tube and the creature loosened its grip on her leg. Both witnesses headed for shore and treated the leg there, which began to sting. Several days later, a green stain with the outline of a palm appeared just below the knee. There was a sighting of an aquatic furry creature of an unknown type in the local water body at the same time 
as the sighting of a UFO in the same area by several independent observers. The UFO hovered 100 feet above the river. On to the next one. I don't have an actual sighting, but rather heard a very unusual scream late one night. I live in rural South Carolina, in a fairly populated area, although I am surrounded by wood. This occurred several months ago, around 2 a.m. I have neighbors who own peacocks, and I'm familiar with the calls and vocalizations they make. The sound I heard was not them. It started out far off and sounded like a cross between a scream, a painful wail, and a moan. It was very loud. Whatever made the sound seemed to be in pain. It continued to get closer to my house, approaching the side, without the security light. I was too frightened to peek out anyway. It just went on and on, and I can't believe no one else heard it. Next thing I knew, it was brushing against my front door. I thought I heard a metallic sound, too. I wanted desperately to look, but I was too scared to. It was still screaming. Finally, it continued on and moved far enough away so that I no longer heard it, and, or, it stopped screaming. Not sure what it was. I haven't heard of Bigfoot here in this area, but you never know. On to the next one. In Wheeler Canyon, in Weber County in Utah, I want to tell you about what happened a very long time ago. I was living up Ogden Canyon in a house in Wheeler Canyon, the second one to be exact. It was fall, and there were a lot of leaves on the ground. Very late one evening, I was sitting in the living room watching TV. My two-year-old son was in the back bedroom asleep. The chair I was sitting on was angled with its back to the window. I got up to go into the kitchen to get a drink. When I turned around in the kitchen to walk back into the living room, I was shocked to see a pair of glowing red eyes staring at me from the window behind my chair through the window. The porch light was also shining through that same window to the left, from my point of view, of the creature's head. All I could see of it was mainly a very dark mass outlined in the window, and the eyes which were reflecting the light and seemed to glow red. I stood in the kitchen doorway, frozen. I kept trying to tell myself I was seeing things, and it wasn't really there. After all, I did enjoy monster movies. Even though the show I was watching that night was a love story, I kept trying to convince myself it was just my imagination. I finally turned and put my back against the wall inside the kitchen doorway and told myself that I'd clear my mind and when I turned around again, it would not be there. I waited long enough to compose myself and then turn my back into the doorway to go into the living room. It didn't work. My visitor was still there. I want you to know that at that time in my life, I had never even heard of a Bigfoot. The only thing in my mind that could look like that was a werewolf. And of course, everyone knows they are only movie myths. I turned around again and walked back to the bedroom where my son was sleeping. I was very shaken, and the only thing I could think to do was call the police. I dialed the operator and asked for the police, but when they came on the line to talk to me, they said because I was up the canyon, I needed to talk to the sheriff. I finally got to talk to the sheriff's department and told them I had a prowler. I certainly couldn't say I had a beast of some kind looking in my window. It took them about 30 to 45 minutes to show up at the house. While I waited, I sat in the dark and just listened, expecting to hear the thing crashing through the door or window at any time. I heard several of the windows along the east side of the house rattle softly, and also the back door, as if someone was testing it to be sure they were secure. After that, there was nothing but silence, and I started to get some courage back before the sheriff showed up. By the time they got there, I was back to the living room and waiting for them. 
They asked for a description, and I said I couldn't see the person because they were standing on the top step next to the porch light, and all I could see was a dark outline of their head and shoulders in the window. One of the deputies was about my husband's height, six foot three, and he stood on the top step and the window framed only his head. They commented that my prowler must be fairly tall. There were no tracks to be found when I looked the next day. Too many leaves. The porch, doorway, and steps at the time were built to go right along the house toward the driveway. Several years later, when I went back to look at the house, someone had changed the door and the stairs to go away from the house and out toward the lawn. It made me wonder if someone else had the same visitor. My husband had laughed at me at the time I told him about what had happened. I took my son and moved out about a week after that. My husband later told me that about a month or so after that, he had a strange encounter early one morning. He was up getting ready for work when he heard a racket out in the porch, so he went out to chase our cats out and stop the noise. As he walked toward the front door, he saw a dark, hairy face looking in at him through the little diamond-shaped window in the door. He stopped and thought bear, and he ran to the front bedroom to put on his pants and grab his gun. By the time he got back out, he was alone again. It wasn't until later, when he was thinking about it, that he realized that it couldn't have been a bear because its face was up close to the window and a bear's snout would not fit close to the window like that. About a year after that, my husband moved to Eugene, Oregon with a friend to work, and he sent me a book on Bigfoot with a note that said, I think you might like to read this. Remember your visitor? Remember, I'll never forget. I still get the shakes when I think about it, and it's been a lot of years. One other note I'd like to mention. When we first moved to Wheeler Canyon, we did so with another couple and they had three horses, which they kept in a corral down by the creek. More than once when I was there, alone in the evenings, I would hear the horses screaming. I'm not talking just their normal horse neigh or such. I'm talking screaming. I told Bob about it, and he said, Oh, don't worry about it. Either the mare is picking on one of the boys, or they can send a wild cat up in the cliff. After my visitor... I think what the horses could sense or smell was not a wild cat. I've told this story to a lot of friends and family, but never reported it to anyone outside of that. I now live with my second husband in Washington, but most of our families are still in the Ogden area. I have no wish for any harm to come to any Bigfoot. Thinking back, I know that the one I had the privilege to see meant me no harm. However, at the time, it sure scared the heck out of me. On to the next one. In Butterfield Canyon Road, below Kennecott Copper Mine, near Talil Harriman in Salt Lake County in Utah. When I was a child, before Bigfoot was known to me, we went on a family camping trip in Butterfield Canyon in the Oroquin Mountains below Kennecott Copper Mine. There were six people there, two adults and four children. The tent was pitched by the creek next to a trail. The tent was tall enough to give the adult a couple of feet of headroom. When we were in the tent getting ready to make our bed, it was thundering with a lot of lightning. We smelled the worst smell. It made our eyes water and our nose run. It was that bad. We could hear a large animal coming up to the tent. It was screaming and yelling. When it got to the tent, it stood over the top of the tent. Our bodies were vibrating from the scream. Our noses and eyes were running from the smell. When the lightning would go off, we could see the shadow of long hair hanging down from massive arms. This thing towered over the tent as we were all ready to die from fear. The adult male that was with us went out of the tent to do something. We had never heard of Bigfoot, and he wanted to protect us. When he came back in the tent, after we heard scuffling and growling outside, he sat down with his back on the tent zipper. His face was white, and his eyes were huge with fear. The first bit of daylight, he had us packed and out of there. Years later, 
He told my granddaughter that he confronted Bigfoot that night and could never get over it. He would never tell us what was there, what he saw. We knew it had to be nine feet tall at least to hover over the tent. There are three witnesses left that can't get over it. There were initially six witnesses. We were in the same large tent all together getting ready for bed. It was a bright night with lots of lightning lighting the sky. Years later, when I was a scout leader, there was a scout from South America that said, I didn't know there were apes in Utah. My mom and I heard them calling each other across the canyon, just like they do in the jungle. On to the next one. In a private, deeded rural community called Indian Mountain, approximately two to three miles west of Kenosha Pass off Road 285 near Jefferson in Park County in Colorado. Vocalizations were heard while camping. We arrived at Indian Mountain in the afternoon of September 4th and set up a two-man tent at approximately an elevation of 9,000 feet. We stoked up a fire and retired to the tent at approximately 2,300 hours. No more than 15 to 20 minutes later, loud but fairly distant howls were heard emanating from the area to the east of our campsite. Dogs in adjacent neighboring properties were very disturbed and barked for some time after hearing sounds in the area. Sounds were heard again approximately an hour later. We were wide awake due to the chill in the air. On the second night, at approximately the same time, same vocalizations were heard. The dogs again were extremely agitated and would not settle down. At approximately 1 a.m., vocalizations were heard once again, and a faint groaning, growling sound as well. About an hour later, shots were heard in the area surrounding our campsite. When talking with neighbors below us, they thought a bear might have come up onto their back porch during the night. Loud footsteps had been heard on their front stoop. I am an avid outdoors woman and not at all normally uncomfortable camping. I have been coming to the mountain for several years. The sounds that I heard that night were very much like the clips I've heard online of Bigfoot. This is my boyfriend's family land. They have owned it for approximately two years. His family usually camps in large trailers. The sons usually camp in tents and have heard the sounds before, but dismissed them as coyotes. Myself and my boyfriend were retiring for the evening after stoking our fire, laying in our tent and talking. We were totally awake and aware when this all happened. It is a very highly forested area of pines, on to the next one. My wife and I were about to start a fire for a barbecue at our ranch south of Leadville. We had just got a fire started when we heard something like a holler or a yell in a very deep tone. The first vocalization lasted about five seconds. Then, after a moment, it hollered again. We have a large pasture behind the house where we graze our horses. After the second vocalization, the horses went running full blast towards us. When they got to us, they were very spooked. Then it hollered again, stopped, and then uttered a few short, very guttural noises. We put out the fire and left. Since the sounds seemed to be very close, at the tree line on the end of the pasture, I would estimate the distance was no more than a quarter of a mile away. The noise this thing made is hard to describe or mimic. It had to be felt as much as heard. It was a deep, low-frequency holler that vibrates in your bones and literally shakes your gut. You could tell it was a very large animal that was making the noise. We have had our ranch for a number of years. This was not the first time we have heard these noises. This was unique because it was the longest, lasting over a three to four minute period. We have also heard what appear to be rocks clacking together and then 
clacking back and forth from a further distance, as if they are answering each other. It is an open ranch land, but bordered by river bottoms with very heavy foliage, lots of willows and alders. On to the next one. This happened off the highway between Copper Mountain and Leadville. As I was driving toward Leadville, I saw what I at first thought was a large tree stump that someone had carved like a totem pole. It was about a hundred feet to my left on the valley floor. While I was marveling at the detail of the carving, the totem pole rotated from the waist up and looked at me. I slammed on my brakes and skidded to a stop on the shoulder. When the dust cleared, the creature was gone. I turned the car around, but no luck. What I saw was hairy from head to toe, very thick with broad shoulders and lacked the strong snout and round rump that bears have. It was daytime, clear light. The site was an open meadow flanked by mountain hillside with lodgepole pine and spruce. On to the next one. The witness, a 32-year-old software engineer, was rock hunting on Forest Road 320 in Long Hollow, two miles off Rampart Range Road, about five miles south of Devil's Head, in Douglas County, Colorado, between 6 and 7 a.m. when this incident occurred. I had been working the site looking for rock for about 45 minutes. I was about 100 feet south from my car, which was out of sight around the outcrop. When I was walking back to my car, I saw the windshield wipers were flipped over, rubber side out. As soon as I saw this, I began looking around, scanning the tree line about 40 feet away from where the car was parked. Just inside the wood, I saw what I thought was the silhouette of a black bear looking at me. I walked slowly, 15 or 20 feet to my car, to the driver's side of my car, watching the bear in the wood. It was about 20 feet in the wood, watching, and the car was between us. I got in my car, still watching the bear in the wood. As soon as I slammed the car door, it stood up. That was when I realized it was not a bear. It ran south, still in the trees, and over the top of the fourth outcrop mound. I saw it running for about three seconds before it was over the top of the mound. It took it about six seconds for it to move from a sitting, crouching position to out of sight. I started the car and drove away quickly and didn't stop until I hit the McDonald's in Woodland Park, where I flipped the windshield wipers over. The total time watching was about two minutes from the first sight of the bear in the woods until he was over the top and out of sight. It was in the shadows of the tree and must have been sitting or crouched down. As I thought it was a black bear standing on all fours, I could see a black mass which did not move as I watched it. When I slammed the car door, it stood up about seven to eight feet tall and it looked like a large dark man covered in black fur. I started my car as soon as it got up and did not watch it continuously as it ran, but did see it for about three seconds. Thinking back, it just seemed curious but at the time, it didn't feel that way. It was about 6 a.m., a nice summer-like morning, clear, some minor clouds. The sighting was in Pikes Peak National Forest, about 8,000 feet in elevation. With large pine forests, rock outcroppings, high meadow grass nearby. On to the next one. In Mesa County in Colorado. I know it was in Grand Junction. I was about 19 at this time, and I was a youth group leader for a Bible study in the mountains at a place called Twin Peak Bible Camp. At night, we all played games like glow-in-the-dark dodgeball or went inside the cafeteria to play telephone or mystery date. Sometimes before bed, we would go out and watch the bat dive bomb small rock we tossed up into the air under the light above the back door. Another game we played at night up there is called Mission Impossible. The idea is that a camp counselor goes into the surrounding woods, which are cordoned off and hides as best as he can. 
everyone else, kids and group leaders, goes to find this person so he can give you a slip that says you found him. If you are one of the first five back, you get ice cream or cake or some prize of that sort. Meanwhile, the other counselors are out with flashlights patrolling around looking for you. If you are spotted, you have to go back to the cafeteria and start over. While I was out looking for the counselor, I was hidden in a bush next to the road leading to the cafeteria. Behind me was the baseball field. It was illuminated by a bright moon out that night. I had ducked into the bushes because two of the counselors who were searching walked right past me. As I was crouched into the thick brush, I was motionless, listening for anything that would tip me off to the whereabouts of anyone else. That, when it struck me, I couldn't hear any of the regular sounds from the woods. No chirp, no animals rustling, none of the natural sound I was used to hearing out there at night. As I started looking around, I heard a light shaking of bushes adjacent to me in the baseball sideline. I'm crouched about five feet from first base, and the bushes were moving over by third base. As I watched, figuring I would see one of the counselors or another searcher come out of the bushes, something else did. It was huge. Myself, I'm six foot four and leveled off this thing as it came out the next fence, which was four foot high. The fence came up to what I can only guess was the waist, which I figured would have put it about eight to eight and a half feet tall. It had gigantic shoulders and a thin waist like you would expect on a bodybuilder. I was dumbfounded and shocked, but not scared as it didn't seem to know where I was or that I was even there. It stepped out cautiously and took a few steps into the open to cross toward the outfield. About two steps into the field, it crouched down and looked toward the road as a couple of kids who got caught came around the bend and walked by me with their backs to the baseball field. Then as they got further away, I looked back and it was on two feet and was moving in a flash. It was across the field in about five to six seconds and into the woods alongside the mountain. When it ran, I could see its wispy hair in the moonlight, but I couldn't make out a color. After it left, I emerged from the bushes and spent the last of the evening in the cafeteria. My mother, who was a counselor, said I must have been cold because I was as white as a sheet. This was not a bear, deer, or elk. Looking back on a once-in-a-lifetime chance, I wish I would have gone and done something foolhardy like try to walk out to it. Though hindsight is always twenty twenty, and I am glad I stayed put and just watched it. It was too far away to smell anything, and the wind was coming down off the mountain. I saw it in silhouette, though I couldn't make out any facial features. It was a clear night at around 11 p.m. with no wind. The only other ambient sound was the river stream down the hill. It was natural wooded forest, mostly tall pine and random bushes. There's a stream running below the camp about a hundred yards away, and the camp itself is a bunch of cabins set in the side of a mountain. On to the next one. This was in El Paso County. I was driving down the highway in a tractor trailer at about 3.30 a.m. I was driving about 65 miles per hour. I went around a corner and on the left side of the road, I saw something that at first I thought was a deer. This thing then stood upright and seemed to be more than seven feet tall. I was able to look at it for just a moment as I was driving by. It had wide shoulders and an ape-like face. Its eyes were yellow like a cat when you shine a light on them. It just kind of looked at me when I went by it. I wasn't able to see anything else. The skies were cloudy. It was a dark stretch of road with no light. It is a mountainous area with pine trees and juniper bushes. There is a residential area on the west side of the road and Fort Carson Military Reservation on the east side. On to the next one. I am a hunter who offers my guide services to paying customers. 
Let's face it, if someone is ponying up several thousand dollars to hunt with me, I have an obligation to put forward my best effort in order to help them get what they came for. Sometimes this means exposing my best hunting areas to total strangers. The area that I'm about to talk about is one such place. All that I'm willing to tell you is that this location is near the shore in the Pacific Northwest. This is my absolute favorite site for black bear hunting, and it is a former logging area located in the coastal hills. There are still many logging roads in this location which are well-worn and easily accessible by four-wheeler, so you can scope out your hunt by truck fairly easily. There is one area in particular that looks like an atomic bomb went off. Your first thought would be that the loggers really messed this place up good. However, it, the reality is that the location's appearance is actually the result of a massive landslide. This event was so large that it dragged entire trees right down to the shoreline. It is an incredible sight to see the power of nature's fury. It is my general habit to go here and seek out active bears before parking and going out to continue the hunt on foot. Now, I'm not really giving up any of my trade secrets here. Every black bear hunter who's worth their salt knows that they mark their territory by snapping off treetops. And it's because of this that I actually came across Bigfoot. I already told you that there are many logging roads still available for use here, but many others are so overgrown on the side that they are impassable unless you are on foot and the bears make good use of these. I have scored many bears by walking down such trails and when they are walking down them, the bears reach up and grab some low brush trees, snapping the tops down. I know you are more than likely already wondering what does this have to do with Bigfoot? Well, the average bear in these parts is between four and 500 pounds. When they stand up to snap a tree, the visible breaks are somewhere around six or seven feet off the ground. The freshness of the breaks can be a very good indicator of what has been frequenting any trail in particular. It's a simple enough tool in my bag of tricks. The trails in here are extremely hard packed so I typically won't see any hardcore tracks. However, I will find superficial pad prints on the loose surface soil, and at best, these prints are a quarter of an inch deep. On this day, I was going into the area alone to prep for a hunt the following week with a paid client. I like to save some time and try to narrow down the best location to find our mark in advance. Of course, the clients know that there are no guarantees when hunting, but as a guide, you won't get many repeat clients or recommendations if you don't produce. At the very least, the clients want to see what they came for, and if they miss their shot, it's not my fault. At this time, I will attempt to give you a picture of the area where the landslide had occurred. Visually, you are looking at a river of tree trunks and branches piled one upon another just like pickup sticks dumped out onto the table. The bears actually can navigate over and through this mess of timber with great agility, and there are literally hundreds of creatures which have made this tangled maze their home. Now, let me get back to the trails for a moment. I was walking the trails looking for tree snaps when I ran across a break that was well out of my reach. Now, I can easily reach to seven feet, which is a height that would indicate the presence of a large bear in the area. However, this particular break must have been 16 feet from the ground. This tree had a very viable trunk of maybe three or four inches in diameter and wouldn't have been easy for even the largest bear to bend over. The typical bushes or small trees that the bear snaps are about two inches thick at the most. The snap that I was looking at was fresh and viable. Thinking about this for a moment, I am an experienced hunter within the confines of an area that I know very well. I've spent 
hundreds and hundreds of hours tracking and hunting bear using this methodology. I do not suddenly see this break and assume that there is a 14-foot-tall black bear running around in here. That is impossible. It also seemed to me that no man had come in here just to climb a skinny tree and mangle the top of it for fun, so, like any person would do, I wondered what might have been able to reach that height and break a tree. The next day, I returned to search for additional bears in the area. As I was walking one of the trails, I saw yet another high tree break, just like the one I had seen the day before. Now that I had found two, I could safely declare that this was a pattern, not an accident. To me, it seemed as though something was mimicking what the bears were doing. Most of the old logging roads here overlooked the area that had been logged, with the entire area now being filled with new growth. Rather than being empty fields, there are seeds of small trees and bushes. The new trees range in height from 10 to 20 feet tall, and this growth is, for the most part, dense and impassable. In a hundred years, it will thin out to a certain degree, but for now, it is a jungle. It is extremely easy to accidentally stumble across a bear in there. And for that reason, most of my clients are very uneasy about following me through this brush. But they will follow where their guide leads. I spotted some bear in this new growth from the elevated logging road. So I went down into the brush to figure out where they might be traveling. I also came across some fresh scat and a number of tree breaks that marked their trail fairly recently. When I got back up to the truck, I decided to spend a little more time looking around with my glasses, and from my position by the side of the truck, I could look down into the sea of trees that I had just explored and notice some of the trees moving around, which is a sure indication that something was walking through them. I would never be able to spot a bear from up here since they are far too low to the ground. The only time you do see them is on the trail, in the open brush or when they are climbing on a log pile. This was not a bear. I looked more closely and began to see some flashes of color. Black and dark reddish brown spots appeared and disappeared as something continued moving through the trees. Now mind you, the trees in the area were between 10 and 20 feet tall with the vast majority of them falling between 8 and 14 feet. Whatever I was seeing had to be clearing that height in order for me to occasionally lay eyes on it. I could see it was steadily moving, parting the trees out of its way as it did so, my hope that I would soon be able to see it in full. Once it reached the river of logs, at that point, it would either have to stop and retreat back into the woods or climb up onto the pile like a bear. I watched intently as it approached the end of the trees and suddenly there it was. A huge Bigfoot was climbing up onto the log. The creature started walking around on the pile as though it was looking for something inside of the log. Occasionally, it crouched down and reached inside of the heap and every now and then I would see it put its hand to its mouth after pulling something from the log. It must have been getting some type of food from within the maze of fallen trees. Personally, I knew there were bird nests, mice, and all sorts of small critters that made this maze of wood their home, but I couldn't tell what this Bigfoot was actually eating. I was wondering why I had never seen it before or seen the high tree break any of the other times I had frequented the area. Maybe it had recently moved into the area and was letting the bears know that it was around. Who knows what the interaction it might have had with the other animals. It was most definitely a mystery. The creature maneuvered with great dexterity around the log like a child on monkey bars. Its fur was long and shaggy, and now that it was in the open sunlight, it appeared to be predominantly blondish red in color with darker undertone from my vantage point and Having seen glimpses of it going through the trees, I would have to say that it was close to, if not fully, 12 feet tall. At one point, I noticed a black bear coming up into the trees maybe a hundred yards away from the beast. And as the bear 
came up onto the pile, it froze before quickly climbing back down and scampering away. I now knew who the boss was, seeing that this bear didn't want anything to do with the Bigfoot. When I took a moment to look directly at the Bigfoot's face, I think that it either saw me or the sunlight reflecting off my binoculars. Whichever it was made the beast stop what it was doing and climb back down into the trees. After a few minutes, I was able to see a little bit of its color and wondered if it had just ducked into the cover to observe me. Perhaps ten minutes or so had passed when I could once again see the trees and bushes shaking, indicating it was moving away from me. I watched this pattern of movement for several hundred yards until the Bigfoot reached the hillside when I saw it emerge from the dense brush and walk in the open until it was completely out of sight. At that point, it was easily more than 1,500 yards away from my position. Even though I still hunt there, I have never seen it again, but from time to time, I still encounter some fresh, high tree breaks. I get the feeling that it really doesn't want anything to do with me or you. I know there is plenty of food around here because of the ongoing dense bear population. We hunt many bear in here, and... For every one we take down, there is another one to take its place in the food chain. Now I know you want to hear about the details. And I am sure that you've heard most of these before. It had to have been four feet wide at the midsection and maybe six feet at the shoulders. These creatures are totally out of the box when it comes to human comprehension. It must be like when someone first comes face to face with a Bengal tiger or a large crocodile you are immediately overwhelmed by how big they are. When on the hunt in Africa, I saw a croc that was six feet wide in the middle and 25 feet long. Seeing this Bigfoot was that type of encounter. It is a once in a lifetime event. Thinking about it for a moment, how many of the 7 billion people on earth have seen a 25 foot long crocodile? And how many do you think will see a 12 foot tall Bigfoot? To me, it's all the same thing being simply a matter of time and chance. This thing exhibited great dexterity on the log pile. Its ability to balance and maneuver in and around the log was amazing, and it appeared to be very comfortable doing so. You and I would be stumbling and trying not to fall, but this Bigfoot was walking around on a random pile of broken limbs and shattered tree like it was no chore at all. Also, the way it was able to walk through this dense woodland for long distances with so little visible effort that it might as well have been crossing a field of wheat showed me that the sheer strength and stamina of these beasts is off the chart. When I had the glasses on it and we were face to face for a moment, I could see that its lower jaw was very wide and I could also tell that a fair amount of its darkly colored face had no hair on it. As far as its legs, arms, and back muscles go, just visualize a large human and multiply the bulk 20 times over. This thing was absolutely enormous in every sense of the word. Its upper arms looked like a bull's thigh. And one of these creatures could likely pick up the tail end of a car with ease. Also, the size of its feet added to its great balance and ability to walk among the logs. And at no point did it appear to lose balance or stumble. It was an incredible sight. On to the next one. I was in the Buffalo River in Tennessee doing a little bow fishing for red horse, white suckers, brown bass, and smallmouth buffalo. At the time, I had manufactured my own version of a fishing bow by rigging the lower section of a fishing pole with a Zebco reel mounted on it, in a reverse fashion onto my recurve bow. I had been fishing for a couple of hours, working both the shallows and the ripples, and the stringer on my belt was now full of fish. I had already decided that after just one more fish, I was going to call it quits for the day. I already had enough for a darn good fish fry, and to be honest with you, I was tired. 
What happened next was so strange that my telling you about it can in no way do it justice, but tell you I will. I was standing in midstream, scanning the ripples and the shallows to my left-hand side, when, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something big moving in the brush. Without making any sudden movements, I stood my ground as though I had seen nothing and continued to watch out of the corner of my eye. Just moments later, I could see the head and shoulders of a booger peering over the top of a bush and then it ducked down again. Although I had never personally seen a booger, I had heard many a tale about them. It was obviously very interested in what I was doing and more than likely in the fish hanging from my belt. Now I must say that I wasn't really afraid, perhaps slightly unnerved, but this booger had sparked my interest. I put the arrow into another red horse and as I was retrieving it, I could see the booger watching me through the bushes. I then slowly made my way toward the bank about 75 feet away from where I had last seen the booger and flipped the red horse onto the bank. Making my way out to midstream, I began to act as though I was looking for another fish. At one point, I actually turned my back to the bank where the fish was now lying. It was about five minutes later when I saw a hand and shoulder emerge from in between some bushes and that darn booger took the fish. I actually had a little smile on my face when I saw this happen, and I decided to do it again. This time around, I had tagged a sucker. Once again, I walked over near the bank, this time in the opposite direction, and left the fish behind. After only a few minutes, the booger had snatched that fish as well. I honestly believe that it knew I was giving them to it, but it was still unwilling to fully show itself. Thankfully, I had entered the creek from the other side of where this booger was hiding, and I decided to leave. As I stepped out of the water, I turned to look back, this time scanning the entire bank carefully, hoping to see the beast, and yet I saw nothing. When I had first seen the booger, it was from the armpit up, as it was peering over the bush. The shoulders had to be all of five to six feet wide. And the head and shoulders were covered in brown hair. The face, which was covered in a shadow, had no hair on it whatsoever. And the eyes looked like two pieces of coal set deeply into the skull. The skin was gray in color, very wrinkled, and the mouth had no lip, being a straight line across the face. Based on just what I had seen, it was crouching behind these bushes that were about six feet tall. I can only imagine how tall it would be had it stood fully up. On to the next one. Back when I retired, my wife and I moved to the Dales, Oregon. I was in a coffee shop one morning when I heard some guys talking about a native racetrack over in Washington so I checked with the U.S. Forest Service and got directions. I went up in late spring after the snow is gone, taking my White Eagle metal detector, a knapsack full of goodies, including some bottled water, extra batteries, and a camera. I was also carrying a canteen of water and a 22 caliber revolver. I went over through Carson, Washington to Forest Road NF6048. From there, I followed it to the trailhead parking spot. This is the southern part of the Indian Heaven Wilderness Area. The part that interested me most was the fact that historic records say that every year this area was used as a gathering place for the Native American tribes of Yakima, Klickitat, and the Columbia River tribes. And they would meet to gather huckleberries. Thousands of people would camp there each spring and summer. This annual rendezvous was quite well known, and it was reported that the tribes had a horse racing competition. I heard they placed bets on every race, and the racetrack had been worn several inches deep and straight as an arrow. One of the local old-timers told me 
that each tribe attending had side bets on all races and huge bets of goods and horses were waged. I figured it would be a great place to metal detect, so I set out to see if I could find artifacts, as it held more excitement than coin hunting in the local park. I followed the trail through the forest and over mountain meadows and hills for several hours, and finally I came down into a beautiful area with two shallow mountain lakes and in between them ran a long straight dirt trail that was the racetrack. It was about 10 feet wide and had to be about 2,000 feet long at least. It was perfectly straight and without any grass or weeds in it. Well, I set my pack down, slung my metal detector off my shoulder, and started looking for any signs of old camps or anything showing where people had been. There were plenty of areas where there were clearings and evidence where trees had been cut in the path, and in one meadow, there was a collapsed structure that must have been made by white men, because the rough timbers had the old square nails sticking out, but it obviously had been fallen down for a lot of years. I did find an old jackknife, but it was not recognizable due to excessive rust. So I placed it back where it had fallen, and it seemed fitting, and it had to be from a white man anyway. The mosquitoes were horrible. Their stinging seemed more like needles as they attacked me without let up. In order to explore a deeper area in a forest of pines, I left my detector and knapsack alongside the rucksack at the northwest end and made my way through a particularly thick growth of balsam. I found a small pond where it seemed alive with frogs and tadpoles. It was filled by seepage from a slightly higher swamp which was full of cattails and grasses. I was probably about two blocks away from my pack when I heard my metal detector chirp several times, but I didn't think much of it because I assumed it may have slid on the grass, but suddenly it went off again, only as it does when I'm swinging it over the ground as I'm searching. As I tore through the brush, I had thought that it may be another hiker, but upon getting back to the clearing, I found my detector lying by the trail and my pack was gone. I ran back to the racetrack so I could get a view of the larger meadow and there was a creature. It was running fast down the racetrack and its gait was hard to explain. Although it ran on two legs, it seemed more of a gallop and it looked shaggy like a camel with that scruffy, loose fur hanging from it like it was malting. I yelled stop and it glanced back at me as it abruptly cut off the trail into the forest. I didn't bother to follow it because I couldn't ride a bike downhill as fast as that thing was going. I did look at its footprint in the sand, and they were huge. I wear a size 10 hiking shoe, and when I placed my foot on its print, it had at least 6 inches over my shoe. Fortunately, my pack only contained snacks, water bottles, and unfortunately my camera so I lost all except for my metal detector and the memory. When I told some friends about my experience, they asked me why I didn't shoot it. But as big as it was, I'm glad I never even thought about it. It might have torn me to pieces. I don't think an animal that large could be stopped by a 22 caliber. Besides, I was out of state and I was in its home. Even though I reported it to the four or three people at the time, I only got an oh wow out of them, and the paper in Dales never did print anything. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!